This is not a test. I repeat this is not a test. American Church be advised. I repeat be advised. Your faith is being challenged and more challenges are coming. Spiritual disasters will be near. Already 42 million American Christians have turned away. You are all in danger. Please prepare immediately. I repeat please prepare. Isn't this conference awesome? I mean, phenomenal, nothing like it, and you were brave to be here. When we think about prophecy, we think about what's been shared today, right? We think about Israel and its future. We think about the return of Christ. We think about the Antichrist and his empire. But do you realize there are just as many prophecies in Scripture that talk about how we will be in terms of our faith, in our morality, in our walk with the Lord at the end of the age, as there is talking about the political scene. Now, that sometimes they aren't as exciting to talk about, but Scripture gives us a picture of how we are going to be at the end of the age. It's a picture we need to look at, isn't it? And so that's where I'm tracking this afternoon. Because I believe, as we read in Matthew 10, 28, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. It is important that we know everything that is shared here. Because that is what's going to happen. But as Joel pointed out, it doesn't really need to be just information in the head. It's got to capture our hearts. Not information that we know, but motivation in how we need to live and be. And so that's what I hope in, in these few minutes, just to take what's been said, what's going to be said, and help it connect with our hearts. Isn't it amazing what was just shared about what's happening in Israel? Yeah. I'm listening and getting so excited. But you know what? That began someone being led by God to do something, and they did it, and they're doing it. When I heard, I think one of the first videos that was shared, 9 million views an impact that our ministries and our lives can have. And so my hope for us is that we learn and grow this weekend, but when we head home, our hearts are captured, and we're saying, God, what do you want me to do about it? All right, I need some participation. I need you to do some thinking. Uh, I want to see some hands this first time. How many of you know someone in your life we get this on the screen. That has someone, that you have someone in your life, friend, friend of a friend, family of a friend, whatever you go to church with, that's serving actively in the military. Hands up all across the room. Thank you, put them down. That represents 1.4 million Americans who are serving actively in the military. And did you see almost every one of us had somebody that we knew? I'm not going to ask for hands, but just kind of think. How many of you know someone that wear glasses, or maybe you're wearing glasses, or you know, some, know someone that, you, that needs to wear them, that maybe you've rode with this weekend? That represents 14 million Americans. How many of you know someone who is battling cancer. Just, you don't have to raise your hand. We all have people who we're heartbroken over right now. That represents 15 million Americans. Right now. Think how many 
do you know who struggle with diabetes? That represents 30 million Americans. And believe me, this isn't a health seminar. I would not be the one up here doing it. <laughs> Hypocrite. Uh, I actually maybe ask this about this room because we're going to have barbecue tonight, right? But how many know someone with heartburn at least once a month in the U.S.? That represents 60 million. And I do want to know about this. Who, ha who has had the flu in here this year? Okay, so it's not, hey, man, you've been lucky. Where do you live? Tennessee's good. Everybody we know. Uh, I mean, it was a huge flu season across the country at its height. The biggest flu season they, they predict could be 64 million Americans. I say all this, and again, not a health seminar, for this number. How many professed Christians right now in America once were in church who has now left the faith? 42 million. It's a 2015 number. 2009, it was 31 million. And so I had this message together. I was ready to do this. And in, the Christ, in Christianity Today, just a couple days ago, Ed Stetzer put out a, a quote that said that Billy Graham's evangelical movement is still going. And he, he talked about how that it had not strayed much. And so I'm like, oh, no, that messes up my whole message, my whole ministry. And so I started going through the numbers and working hard through them and still... Evangelicals had dropped 10% just over the last 20 years of the population when they were only 30, represented 30% to begin with. And mainline Protestants. And so and looking at that, it led me to a new study just came out that said 65 million. And to put in context of that, only 29% of that 65 million that they found was raised out of church, meaning they had never gone to church. 71% of those not affiliated, well, that's actually wrong. That's the huge percentage. This is, my number's mixed up here. Too many numbers. I'm not good at math. Huge problem, isn't it? Let's look at it another, a different way. When we have big problems in our country, we try to fix them, right? And so I, I thought, well, how many people do the, the biggest charities, the Forbes Top 100 charities in America, do they impact? And I began thinking, well, what would be some of the biggest needs? One of the major charities, if you go through the list over and over again, is feeding hungry children in America. Represented 15 million that they say children need, which is huge. Many of the main charities are helping veterans who have been disabled. A worthy cause it represents 3.8 million. And when we think charities, which has just gone down in the last several years, but used to, the big push was for AIDS research. 1.5 million who have AIDS are in HIV now. The number five on the, all charities, as far as, I mean, receiving millions and millions of dollars in revenue in a year. Habitat for Humanity, those homeless, only 600,000 at one time right now in America is homeless. American Cancer Society, I already shared that. We hear so much, so much money raised, 15 million. American Heart Association, 5.7 million. Susan G. Komen, which we see everywhere in the big push, represents 156,000 women with breast cancer. All of these worthy causes, heartbreaking but again, how many Americans have left the faith? 42 million right now. And that's a number that is conservative. And what are we doing? What are we doing about that? I'm launching a, a podcast called Hold On, coming out in June. And I have my first guest. We're trying to get this recorded and get a pilot together. And he's really the guy who has done probably the most research in this area across the country. 
And he said, Jake, there is, I have not found a church that has a ministry within the church that is about bringing people back. So we've got this huge problem that we're not doing anything about. So why would I share this at a prophecy conference? Because 42 million of people like us have left the faith and we ain't seen nothing yet, have we? The things that we're talking about are coming and with those a promised turning away and we can't remain faithful now. I want to share a little bit about how I got here. Not my ride here, but <laughs> life-wise. I was a senior pastor, been at the church for 12 years. We loved it. It was a quintessential Southern Baptist church. Oh, did I just disclaimer? <laughs> just, uh, shut, shutting off now after that. But just quintessential what you think about average church in America. And God was doing some great things. We loved it. Me and my wife, my family. And I always felt called to write. So I was doing some writing. I started writing the book Spiritual Prepper. Uh, and I was preaching these messages on overlooked prophecies. These prophecies that we see in Scripture. But we know the Scriptures, but we don't realize that they're prophecies. We talked about our faith and morality. Anyway, as I'm, I'm working through that, I run across this number. And I just become convicted that many are turning away. But we shouldn't be surprised because we're foretold this. One of those passages that just captured my heart. Matthew 24, 10. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Now, that's talking about a specific time. It's talking about these things unfolding. We call them the birth pains and those signs that's a, the trajectory we're on. And then over and over and over in Scripture, you read verses like this, Matthew 24, 13, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And you hear this message to stand firm, and you hear this message to hold on to the faith, you hear this message to be overcome over and over in Revelation, right? And so it is understood and it was taught that we can turn away. And I know that opens up all kinds of cans theologically. But at the minimum, it means we can lapse in our faith. And I promise you, when we see the Lord on the other side, we're going to want that back, aren't we? And so here I am, I'm writing this and, and preaching this, and I just become completely convicted as I look out at my congregation. It is foretold that if they face that time prophesied, that they would, majority would turn away and I'm asking myself, what have I done to prepare them? Several of you are past, pastors and church leaders. Think about it. When you stand out before your congregation, and I just became completely convicted. You know, I hope I've preached some good sermons. I've, hoped, I've taught some good things. hope we started some good ministries. We were making an impact. But when stuff hit the fan, where are my people going to stand? So I got so convicted, I quit. <laughs> kind of unrelated. We started a ministry called Prophecy Simplified, where we thought we could go share. I, I, I felt, my, my church said, hey, you can stay on, you can go speak at conferences, you can do that. But the thing is, to be honest, you're here because you give a flip about prophecy, right? For the most part. Are your spouse drug you here? <laughs> Are you love Becky and Rob? But I wanted to go to be available on Sundays to go when no one wanted to hear. Do you know how hard it is to go talk about prophecy in churches in America? So two weeks ago, we changed the name of the ministry. <laughs> To stand firm ministries. Because we're, we're thinking at least if we could get the conversation started that we need to persevere, that leads us to looking what's ahead. 
And so we've got this heart. want to share that within our churches. I want to share a little more to my story because I want you to see where I'm coming from. And I think this is important for us as we embrace these different things. So I was at 16. I'm on the school bus on a field trip with my headphones on, my big Walkman, and my mixtape, and somewhere between Ace of Base and Nirvana, eclectic taste, I feel God speaking in my heart, Jake, I want to use you. I didn't know what to do about that, but I had heard preachers say sometime, hey, if you want, like church camp, if you want to commit, surrender to ministry, come forward. So I so a couple months later, I walked down the aisle. That probably never really happened in her church too much. I told my pastor that. He turned around and said, Jake's gonna, Jake has surrendered to preach, and he's going to preach for us next week. And I was just like, God told me, God's leading me something. It ain't nothing about preaching. So I did that. And so, you know, teenage years, so you got to figure out what you're going to do with your life. And so now I feel like God's telling me what to do. So i got to pick a school and go to. And so I knew about three Christian colleges. And so... I picked the one that was the cheapest to go to. And to get there, but this is my goal, going to college, to study Bible, study pastoring, was, God, if you can open a door for me to serve in a church, I am out of here. Please open that door. And I sat through a miserable semester without a door opening. Somewhere in that second semester, somewhere between the systematic theology and interpretation of the Bible I became completely convicted that if a physician, if a doctor had to do all the training and learning that they have to do to deal with physical life, then I needed to put in as much training and learning if I was going to deal with eternal life. Now, I say that to not to say it had to be formal. So praise the Lord, he didn't open a door to serve in a church till right after that. Along with that conviction also became that much of the preaching really around our country was not driven from Scripture, and it was not rightly dividing Scripture. And so I became convicted that you had to do the, the work in the, the text, in the Bible, where you did the exegesis, where you dug into what it meant, what the author meant, and what it meant to the audience, right? What it meant then. As has been said, as has been said in the message to go, that's why I love this lineup of speakers, because the hard work's being done. And so you go to the text and you see what it meant, and that gives you a framework to see the things it can be here. So I have this conviction, and on top of that conviction about doing, doing the work and rightly dividing Scripture is the authority of Scripture, that Scripture, when you hear it, should transform your life. I mean, it wasn't just writ written just to be there. It wasn't written just to inspire us to have a good day. It was written to be obeyed. It was written to be how we lived. And that's not just the epistles or the gospels. That includes prophecy. That includes the Old Testament. That includes Revelation. And just to be frank... We do not have good hermeneutics. There are not good hermeneutics being practiced in terms of prophecy across our country. Amen. I don't get it. The academic world, I wanted to be in that. And it's not cool to be a premillennialist in that world. So when I was in seminary, I became an amillennialist for a couple years. And I, was, I was teaching a, a, a seminary, a lay seminary. And I went to this, this meeting of people doing the thing I'm, I'm doing, and so they're all talking about their, their all, all meals and replacement theologists, and they, they come to me, and finally I just settled, I'm pre-meal. And they're like, man, you know, what's wrong with you? They just look at you like you, you're not refined. <laughs> so the academic world, and you, you pick up a scholarly commentary on Scripture, and a lot of times they just skip What's being said? And then, in, in, and then it's not even being touched in some of our churches. And then with po a lot of popular teachers that I love what they preach and say. I have their books. I love what they say in Romans. I love what they say in Matthew. 
But it, they come to Revelation and they just lose their mind. And it, either go to crazy town or they just picked up this prepackaged Tim LaHaye package and drop it in their book. I don't get it. I want to say names, but I won't say names. There's people, I love their books, but I'm like, all their other books. But when it comes to Revelation, they, they don't work critically in the text as they do with other places. We, so with all that, I have no idea. I think I went way off track there. But based on those convictions, as I began reading that many will turn away, as I begin to really read that, that revised Roman Empire view of the, the kingdoms in Daniel, that many of the, the evidence were very shaky, and actually look at the text, it was by not just, it was, yes, a call of God, yes, an inspiration from God, yes, a leading of the Spirit, I believe, to, to begin this, this ministry, but just the authority of the text says many will turn away and we need to do something, right? We need to do something. So many are turning away. We need to stand firm. Listen, we've not seen nothing yet. And we can't remain faithful. Tom and Joanne shared the story of the father and son where they beheaded the son in front of the father and they began passing around the boy's head as a football. He, this father stood for his faith in the fa face of persecution. And we can't even, across America, get our kids off the baseball fields, softball fields, and basketball courts to go to church on Sunday. We've got to begin talking about this in our churches. Now, prophecy is 25% of Scripture, so, so it's not the only thing you talk about. I see it swing the other way, right? It becomes all that you talk about, all that you deal with. We've got to remain faithful. Yes, I, my heart is, is that we would go back and, and take these things to our churches. We would begin applying them. But I would be remiss to be up here and talking about turning away and not challenge you and me. Because when we hear this turning away, I imagine you're like me, you have in your head, well, that would never be me. Who would be that stupid to turn away? I would never do that. You know, if you do that, you're quoting scripture. So Matthew 24, 10 says that many will turn away. That word for turn away is used again. That Greek word is used again in Matthew 26 as Jesus is before the disciples at the Last Supper. And he says, hey guys, tonight you're going to turn away. And Peter says, not I, Lord. If I have to die for you, I will. And Jesus laughing inside says, well, actually, Peter, you're going to deny me three times tonight. Listen, it can be any one of us. My time as a pastor, the most heartbreaking thing was to see someone come in and taste the Lord, begin to follow Him, and then now I can't even find Him. I want to give you two motivations. Then I want to wrap up again just touching on how we need to take this back to our churches. But I hope, I hope this afternoon, I hope definitely before you leave from these two days, you make a commitment to stand firm, to hold on, to be a spiritual prepper. So somewhere in this process of God working with me, I sat through a whole marathon of the National Geographic show, Doomsday Preppers. You may caught it. So each show they would take this family that was preparing for some kind of doomsday you know, whatever it was, and they would film, they had these people come out and they would grade them. So I watched, I think like 
I know I need to get a life, but I watch it like 12, 14, I don't know, episodes after one another. Every one of them preparing for something different. You know, the first one was this young lady who, who thought there would be this, uh, you know, economic collapse. And so she needed to get out of town to get gas for her car. So she had a car stashed outside of the city. And she knew a track to get out and get gas and get her car. Another young lady of the same age pictured mass chaos and civil war. So she was training to be a sniper. You had the family that built the bunker. You had the family that thought it was going to be a smallpox outbreak, and so they practiced bugging out. My favorite was this, this guy who lived in the suburbs, and he was preparing, and so he turned his backyard into this farm, and his swimming pool became the tilapia pond. And his wife wasn't tracking with him, so that was... <laughs> there was this, the 16-year-old boy who was convinced there would be a zombie apocalypse. And so they're filming him how that he was going to miss his prom so he could train with the bow staff. No joke. There's just one after another. And I'm watching this and I'm like, okay, there's like 20 different ideas. Somebody's going to be wrong. That'd be a terrible thing to be wrong about, wouldn't it? Spend all that time and money and then you're wrong about the end of the world. But listen, even if you nailed it and you got it right, if you got good with the bow staff and there was a zombie outbreak, you're not going to, what are you going to do, add like 10 years to your life? And the thing that you hear is over and over again, well, I want my family to live on. I'm doing this for my kids. The best thing we can do for our kids is spiritually prepare them. So my heart is, is that you would be a spiritual prepper. And I we joked about the physical prepping thing, but if you're here at something like this, we realize things are going to happen, and there should be, we would be dumb not to have some type of prepping. But more than anything, it's our heart. It's our soul. It needs to be prepared. Each one of us are susceptible of at the minimum just lapsing in our faith. Now, I guess coming to an event like this, it's just assume everybody uh, can draw a premillennial timeline in, out. And so there's a piece of paper there. No. So I'm gonna, but I want to put one up here. Try to make it simple. Uh, so right now we're in this present age. There's going to be the Antichrist appear, and eventually he makes this covenant with many. We read about in Daniel, which starts a seven-year time clock, so the last seven years of this, this age. And then we have the Battle of Armageddon, Jesus coming back on the white horse, and then he's king, and Satan's locked up the millennial kingdom for a thousand years, where we get to be on earth with Jesus as king. Then only through the providence of God... Let Satan loose. One more rebellion. It's beat. And then we enter in a time that when we think of eternity, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. I don't like to say new earth and new Jerusalem because I think a lot of times, you know, I, I share this at a church and someone's like, I don't want to live in the city forever. You know, I want to get out and do something. Well, we've got the Garden of Eden all over, and then we've got this immaculate new Jerusalem that get to live in. And then some point in life, the rapture, I'll let somebody else tackle that. <laughs> but I put this up here, and I know many of you are familiar with it. But look, when we talk about the end times, we're talking about this right here. It is a terrible marketing thing to say end times. Because for believers, it's the beginning of everything. We have so much to look forward to. So we have no, we could not even have another breath. And I think as we see, as we're tracking through this weekend, we're way down the tracks, tracks in this present age. But then we have so much to live for. 
So for you who, who know these things, who are willing to listen to these things, let the picture of the eternity to come capture your heart and do something with it. And one last one, or one more motivation for you is in this promised kingdom, somehow God promises rewards. So you have the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 when, you know, this is the best prophecy conference I think you can go to, but there was one better a couple thousand years ago. They're on the Mount of Olives, great location. The disciples ask Jesus, when's the temple going to be destroyed? When, when are you going to return? And he sits down with them one-on-one, -on -one, walks through it, gives the signs. And then the majority of his message, though, is application, go out and live this. And he gives us parables. He talks about the ten virgins, you know, being ready. So we need to be ready. But then he has that next one, the, the parable of the talents or gold bags or whatever version you have. Where he talks about the being a faithful servant while the master's gone. In Luke 19, we find one very similar. But it's a parable in which Jesus stays close to reality. And he says that there was this noble son who is going to be king and he comes to this land and he leaves but he leaves these people in charge and he gives these minas which was like three months salary and he tells his servants to go and invest them and use them and one goes out he receives a tenfold another one one's fivefold one way less than that and many others who didn't do anything Jesus come back came back and we know from Matthew 25, the very similar, the parable of talents, right? He says to those who invested that wisely, who had the big return, he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well, if you're reading the Luke account, he says, well done, my good, he says, well done. Then he says, I now make you in charge of 10 cities. Now, I don't know if that's tracking with the parable or if that's the reality of the kingdom, but whatever it is, our faithfulness is going to matter. But each day, our faithfulness is being challenged. We used to run this drill in football, and I was on the line. I was slow. I never, you know, unless it was a fumble, that's the only time I'm ever going to touch the ball. <laughs> and, but they'd have us all take the ball and run. They'd have the team and, and what, you know, facing each other in this line, and you'd run through it called the gauntlet. And everybody's swinging and swatting at each at the ball, trying to get it loose. That's kind of what life is. But we're talking about a time that's coming where they're going to, where the evil one is going to be swinging hard. If we get to be a part of that, are we prepared to remain faithful? So I ask you, with everything that's being shared this weekend, let it capture your heart. When I was going through this process of seeing, okay, Lord, you're calling me to do this and all this stuff, I, I took this chance to, to speak at a church for, I think, four weeks in a row on, on Sunday nights. And we had the kids at a babysitter, and me and my wife went, and we thought, this is going to be our prayer fleece. We'd put it out there, God, if this is working. So the first night, I, I walked through the timeline in Daniel 2 of the kingdoms. And I plugged in the years. And I said, man, we're way, 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 way down the tracks, you know. I said, we're the toe jam of the statue. <laughs> and we get, in the, we get in the car that night. And my wife says, Jake, do you realize what you just said? And I changed the subject. I said, do you think the kids are still going to be up? And we went through that several times. And I'm like, I preached the message. And it's still so hard to capture my heart. The verse has already been shared that we have daylight now, but nighttime is coming. We need to make the most of it. And listen, if us in this room who understand and are willing to listen do not commit to stand firm, how in the world can we expect anybody else that we love and know to do so? We have to stand firm. But unfortunately, for you here, for you streaming at home in your, your pajamas, 
My wife asked me if she could do that. I said, no, please go with me. You know, I look better in person. I was talking about something. But it's a situation like on the airplane, you know, when they give you the spill about how to do the seat buckle and where to jump out. And, and then they say, if the mask come down, if, if the door flies open or something and the mask comes down, put yours on first and then help the person next to you. You know where the masks are. You've been informed. Maybe not during this session. I don't know what this was, but you've been informed throughout this weekend. There's a whole row of books out there where you can be informed. It's one called Spiritual Prepper, if you hadn't. Anyway. <laughs> We've got people in our families, in our churches. If you're a church leader, we've got to put the mask on. Usually we take the mask off at church, but you know what I'm saying. And so I, I really wrestled with that, you know. In, in the book, I got this 25-point checklist of all the things you need to do, prepare. And I, I was just really wrestling with this because what I hear is, Jake, you know, at my church, man, I prepare my, my people every Sunday. You know, we, we're teaching from Scripture. So, and, and I, you know, I, I had to think about it. I worked through that. I was like, yeah, but we don't. And I really think the key is, oh, those were the pictures. The key is, is that we've got to intentionally prepare. Intentionally make an effort. I'm blessed right now to attend. And I pray that I never get to attend because I want to be in a church sharing to remain faithful. But the church... I attend, I, it really honestly is one of the, it's a large church, one of the best in the country. Man, they teach the scripture, they're missional. They got more ministries than I can keep up with. And I'm sitting in the, this sanctuary of like 3,000 people one Sunday and I'm looking around and this is perfect, biblically accurate message. And they're just shared all these steps to get involved in ministry. Wonderful. But the my, the, what was on my heart was, I'm in a room of sheep headed to slaughter. Because no one's telling them what's coming. We've got to be intentional. And so that means somehow, I, I think that in our lives, first we need to be intentional in our lives. You know, we need to be making sure we're walking in the Spirit. We need to know the truth. We need to be obeying. In our churches, we need to be teaching the truth, leading, but we've got to be intentional with what's coming. I went to a pastor's conference the other day to, to have a booth about the ministry and stuff and bug pastors. Two days of this conference on evangelism. And I got home, and I realized we never sang one song about the return of Christ. We didn't sing one song about the coming kingdom. We sang about victory in Jesus. We did sing a song about him being king. And in two days of great sermons on evangelism, never once was the kingdom of heaven mentioned. I think at a conference in Tyler, Joe, you said, we're not sharing the whole gospel if we don't share the kingdom. I mean, every good sales pitch has got to have the reward, Right? We've got to be intentional, just planning songs about the future, speaking about it, talking about it in our lives. 42 million right now have walked away. It could be 65 million. And it could be any one of us. Will you commit to stand firm? And will you be intentional? That 42 million is a big number. And we're not doing really squat about it. We need to. But there's a bigger number out there, you know. There's billions who don't know Christ. And I think all of us are at least getting to the point through this weekend and definitely by the time we leave will agree we do not have much time to reach them. We need to make the, what time we have count.
Thank you for enduring and holding on and standing firm for this session. <laughs> Carry that same stand firmness out of here this weekend. Can I pray for you? Father, there is so much that you have for us. Lord, we can't describe it. We can't put it into words. And when we do, we don't even scratch the surface of it. Lord, you are worth us going through death, going through the worst imaginable thing. Lord, let us have that vision of what is to come. And let us hold on and stand firm no matter what. But Father, I pray in this room, maybe there's leaders, maybe there's parents, maybe there's friends, family members, that they would go and they would help someone else put on the mask and know what's coming and prepare for it. Lord, help us be spiritual preppers and help us lead others to be ready as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.